Hi guys, this is Weasel for PokerBrainiacs.com. We are going to be discussing the topic of 3-betting and the best 3-bet strategy we can use. It's going to be a multi-part series because it's quite a complex topic, but we are going to try and give it the best overview we possibly can. To begin with, what is a 3-bet? And sometimes the exact definition of a 3-bet causes some confusion. Some mistakenly believe that it means that you are betting three times the previous raise, but it actually just applies to any time a player makes the third bet on any given street. So it doesn't have to be pre-flop. You can make a 3-bet on the flop, turn or river. We are going to be focusing mainly on pre-flop 3-bets, however. And the reason it's called a 3-bet, and you may think, well, someone open raises, someone re-raises, isn't that a 2-bet, technically? The reason it's called a 3-bet is because the mandatory big blind that the big blind has to post is considered the first bet pre-flop. Therefore, the open raise by another player is going to be considered the second bet, and then when that open raise gets re-raised by another player, that is going to be considered the third bet in the sequence and therefore constitutes a three bet. Let's have a brief look at the topics we are going to be considering. We are going to start off by looking at the three bet, four bet, five game. What is it? We are also going to consider some of the reasons we want to three bet. We are going to look at preflop three betting. So when we are the three better and how that changes depending on whether we are in position or out of position, which hands we want to three bet, etc. And that also is based very much on our understanding of the positions involved at the table. So there will be a brief section on positional awareness. We are going to consider how we respond when we are the one facing a preflop three bet again whether we are in position or out of position and how we can combat being 3-bet by opponents. Then we are going to go on to consider how we are going to play in various post-flop situations either as the pre-flop 3-better in position and out of position or as the pre-flop caller. To begin with, the 3-bet 4-bet 5 game, what is it? Well, you can consider the 3-bet, 4-bet, 5 game almost to be an entire game in itself. The goal of this game is to manipulate the range or the frequencies that you 3-bet, 4-bet or 5-bet in order to gain an edge over your opponent. To illustrate how the 3-bet, 4-bet, 5 game works, let's consider a very simple example. The effective stacks are 100 big blinds. Player A is on the button and player B is in the big blind. Player A open raises on the button. Player B who is in the big blind however knows that player A likes to open raise the button very wide. Player B therefore decides to put in a 3 bet. However player A knows that player B is going to be 3-betting light in this spot as a result of player A opening the button wide and therefore player A decides this is a good spot to put in a 4-bet as a bluff. However, player B knows that player A is expecting him to be 3-betting light a lot in this spot considering that player A, his button opening range is quite wide and so player B figures that player A is going to be 4-betting light a considerable amount in this spot and player B decides to shove all in as a bluff. And typically the 3-bet, 4-bet, 5 game ends at this particular situation after the 5-bet because assuming the players are playing with 100 big blind stacks which is a common stack size then all the money will be in and so the 3 bet, 4 bet, 5 game ends here. In this particular case, player A and player B 
are assuming each other are light. But just because they're assuming this, it doesn't necessarily mean it is the case. If either player A or player B had made a relevant adjustment in this previous example, they could in fact find themselves in a very advantageous situation. So what kind of adjustments are we talking about? Well, player A knows that player B is through betting light, so perhaps player A could begin opening tighter. After all, player B is only through betting light because player A is opening wide from the button. So if player A begins to open the button a lot tighter, he is effectively setting a trap for player B, who believes that player A's button opening range is very wide. What about player B? What could player B do? Player B knows that player A is going to be 4-betting light a reasonable amount of the time because he is assuming that player B's 3-bets are quite light. Therefore, player B can begin 3-betting tighter, in effect setting a trap against player A's 4-betting range. And the adjustments continue. Player A can begin to 4-bet tighter. After all, player B is assuming that player A is 4-betting quite wide, which is the reason that player B can profitably 5-bet shove as a bluff over player A's 4-bet range. And finally, player B can 5-bet shove tighter. Now, if we assume that player A and player B both make all these adjustments, so now player A and player B are both th are all 3-betting, 4-betting and 5-betting and opening very tight. What is the next adjustment that these players could proceed to make? Player A could perhaps begin open raising loose again. And the reason he can do this is because he knows that player B is now 3 betting tight. So player A is going to take advantage of stealing player B's blinds and knows that he is going to find an easy fold when player B does decide to 3 bet seeing as player B is now 3-betting tighter. However, player A is going to continue to 4-bet light because he knows that player B's 3-betting range is quite tight. Player B, though, is eventually going to adjust to this. And he is going to begin by 3-betting looser again because he realises that player A is opening looser again. However, player B is going to continue to 5-bet tight because he knows that player A's 4-betting range is still very strong. And then we think on the next level of adjustments. Player A starts to 4-bet loose again when he realises that player B is 3-betting loose. And player B, upon realising that player A is 4-betting loose, begins to 5-bet loose again and we find ourselves back in the example we had previously where both players are just 3-betting, 4-betting and 5-betting very loose. What can we conclude from this? That the 3-bet, 4-bet, 5 game is not a static game against good opponents. You will find that when two good players are playing the 3-bet, 4-bet, 5 game they are going to be constantly adjusting trying to find an edge against the other player, trying to make relevant adjustments in order to come out with an edge. Also we can see that your 3-betting range will vary depending on your opponent, so there is no point 3-betting the same range of hands against all of your opponents. And just because both players, player A and player B, were adjusting in the previous example, you will of course come across many players who are simply just not adjusting to the 3-bet, 4-bet, 5-bet game and therefore in those cases you can find the relevant adjustment to make and you can stick with that adjustment and continue making that play against your opponent and continually exploiting them. And this pretty much enforces the idea that it's dependent on game dynamic. So and the game dynamic is also variable depending on which stakes you're playing. For example, if we take a common situation in the micro stakes, it's very unlikely you will ever find a game where the game dynamic is conducive to one player making a 5-bet bluff jam. 
and the reason being players at the micros are simply not 4 betting light enough for 5 bet jamming to be a good strategy against the majority of players. You will of course find some players who you can profitably 5 bet bluff jam against but in general it's not going to be a winning play at the micros. However as you start to move up stakes uh, to small stakes for example you will find an increasing number of players who are competent at playing the 3-bet, 4-bet, 5-bet game and they are going to be adjusting their own 3-bet, 4-bet, 5-bet ranges depending on the hands which you 3-bet, 4-bet or 5-bet and against these players you may find a situation where in order to sustain an edge you need to continually adjust to their adjustments against you However, you will of course still find many players at the small stakes who are simply not adjusting or perhaps they over adjust or perhaps they make some kind of adjustment and then it seems to settle down into some kind of equilibrium where hopefully you have a slight edge but they are not capable of finding the next relevant adjustment in the sequence to combat whatever you are doing. And then as you move up to mid stakes, high stakes, Obviously you're just going to find less players whom you can play a static 3-bet, 4-bet, 5-bet game against and you're going to find many more competent players who know how to play the 3-bet, 4-bet, 5 game well and you are going to need to play a very or take a very dynamic approach to exploiting their 3-bet, 4-bet, 5-bet ranges. And basically what I'm saying is it can involve some intense leveling and in some cases it may be very profitable if you are capable of making a preemptive adjustment and what this means is if you are playing a very good opponent and uh, this opponent knows how to adjust to your the way you are playing the 3-bet, 4-bet, 5-bet game you can preempt how he is going to adjust and make your next adjustment for just as he adjusts and this can be a very profitable strategy difficult to implement but if you're capable of doing this then it can be very profitable there are some particular very common level spots and I will discuss two of them where typically players end up thinking on some type of level and the first one is when you 3-bet bluff someone twice in a row or perhaps even more times and the most common level people end up on is that the second time it's not going to be a bluff because they just think something along the lines of you'd have to be stupid to try and 3-bet bluff them twice in a row and a lot of the time when you do 3-bet someone twice they are going to interpret the second one as very strong because they don't think you'd bluff them twice in a row not always you are going to get a small percentage of players who when they see they've got three bet twice in a row they'll proceed to four bet but I've heard stories against again about some players who they've been three betting light against someone and they've three bet a second time and that player seems to be on the level wow they wouldn't three bet me twice in a row as a bluff and they fold they, he has to have it this time and then that player goes on to three bet them a third time in a row and this player is just sitting there leveling himself thinking wow he must have it this time he wouldn't three bet me a third time as a bluff he has to have it and so it continues so in some particular cases it can be a good leveling spot to three bet bluff somewhat just after you've three bet bluffed them the second spot actually involves a situation where players often make a preemptive adjustment but likely it's an incorrect adjustment because they are thinking on the wrong level. And that's when a player is 3-betting someone, a load, and that player then decides to 4-bet. And the player that's doing the 3-betting he sees that he's being 4-bet by a player who has just been sitting there folding and he thinks to himself, wow this guy has to be playing back now, I've 3-bet him so many times and he's finally 4-bet me after all these times I've 3-bet bluffed him, he has to be playing back now, I'm going to 5-bet jam as a bluff 
So what they are effectively doing is making a preemptive adjustment because they are assuming that that player is going to begin four betting light at some point of the time. So when that player first begins to four bet light, they then five bet as a bluff over the top. When in actual fact, if the player who is doing the four betting is not even thinking on that level in terms of he is just going to sit there and fold and only four bet with a strong hand, then the player who decides to five bet bluff jam has really just leveled themselves into a spot where they are just going to be shoving against a very strong range. So if you are three betting someone as a bluff relentlessly and they do finally decide to four bet after a long time it's probably just a good idea to fold they are quite possibly not playing back at you they've just picked up a hand so while preemptive adjustments can often be very effective you have to be thinking on the right level for them to work and that's a good example of when it's not on the correct level a lot of the time it can be a good idea to four bet as a bluff the first time someone three bets you uh, because it can be interpreted a lot stronger that way whereas if you end up waiting uh, a few attempts before you four bet bluff it's a very common preemptive adjustment for people to perhaps bluff jam over the top expecting you to play back so in reality what happens is by folding to the first three bet or the first few three bets you end up putting yourself in a situation where you do really actually have to wait for a strong hand before you can play back because villain is just going to assume you are playing back anyway so the point I'm really trying to put across is in terms of the 3 bet 4 bet 5 bet game there is quite a lot of psychology and leveling involved and if you can get to grips with the leveling involved in these particular spots then you can hopefully find an edge there also Okay, let's get on to actual 3-betting strategy. What are the reasons we 3-bet? There are three main reasons, and you should ideally have one in mind before you 3-bet. So there's no need to just 3-bet wildly. You need to have a good, good solid idea of why you're 3-betting. And these three reasons are, one, value. You have a strong hand, and you want to raise preflop for value. Two, you have a bluff, and your goal is to take the pot down pre-flop. And the third reason is to set up a steal attempt, and that steal can either be post-flop or pre-flop, and we will come on to discuss that later. I've put don't make the mistake of 3-betting a merged range versus everyone, and this is part of the reason why you have to have a reason regarding why you are three betting what some players do is they think to themselves okay I'm going to three bet eight percent of the time and I'm going to three bet the top eight percent of hands and the problem is while this may even work against some players against other players it's going to be a really terrible idea three betting an eight percent merged range as hopefully we will go on to consider so if you are going to follow a strategy where you just take the top X percent of hands and 3-bet them against everyone, you are going to spew money because it is not a an effective 3-betting strategy. And the reason it's not is because depending on our reason for 3-betting, and we'll go on to analyze the different reasons, but depending on this reason, you are going to want to 3-bet a different type of range so either a polarized range or a merged range and that range can then be weighted towards different types of hands for example value or bluffs so it's not just a case of three betting x percent of hands we are going to want to three bet different types of ranges against different types of opponents first of all let's consider three betting for value and it's a pretty simple concept we have a strong hand and we want to raise it up pre-flop for value. We need to target players with a low fold to 3-bet and a high attempt to steal. And a low fold to 3-bet means they are going to continue with a wide amount of the hands that they open raised pre-flop and 
a high ATS means that that range, which say open raise preflop, is going to be quite wide to begin with. So combined, these two stats, the player opens wide and then continues to a 3-bet with a big part of this range. Let's look at an example to see why this low fold to 3-bet is important. Let's pretend hero holds ace-jack offsuit on the button and villain who has an attempt still of 25 which is reasonably high not overly so and a fold to 3 bet of 85% which is very high opens on the button so this player is perhaps stealing somewhat from the cutoff where villain is opening from which I haven't included but villain is opening from the cutoff not that it necessarily matters seeing as we have the stats but villain is opening somewhat wide and he is then responding very tightly to three bets on the button. So if we bring up the example, this is pretty much what's happening. Player in the cutoff makes it three dollars to go and hero who is on the button raises to ten dollars and we can see this player has a fold to three bet of 85 percent. So if we open up a copy of Poker Stove and perhaps consider some of the ranges involved, we're saying that this player is, for a start, opening a 25% range. And in general, people's opening ranges, while not necessarily being a merged open range, uh, a completely merged range, they will roughly represent a type of merged range. So what we'll do is we'll give this player a 25% range in fact we'll give it slightly less than 25% range because for example some of the the differences between this player's opening range and a merged range is that this player is going to be opening hands like pocket fives, pocket fours, pocket threes, pocket twos even though that they're not necessarily included in a 25% merged range uh, so this is maybe add some other hands in there just to get up to 25% like maybe add this suited ace in as well uh, a couple of suited connectors so 24.9% range so if we say roughly this is what we expect this player to be opening from the cutoff with and of course it's going to vary from player to player but as a very rough guide this should do we are now going to say that this player in fact, let's first see what Hero's equity is going to be against that range. So we know that Hero has, in this case, the Ace of Diamonds and the Jack of Clubs, not that the suits matter. So against the range that Villain is open raising from the cutoff with, Hero has 55% equity. Now, we are saying that Villain is going to fold 85% of the time when here are three bets so in effect villain is going to be folding 85% of that range that he is open raising from the cutoff so if we um, take our calculator and if we establish what is 15% of a 25% range, so we have a 25% range times it by 0.15, 50%. So we can see that of the range of total hands, that villain is going to be continuing with about 3.75. So if we now adjust his range to around 3.75, and again, you can see it's not going to be a true merged range according to poker stove but if we edit it slightly in fact if we take up pocket nines so we have ace queen suited ace king suited pocket aces ace king off kings queens jacks tens which perhaps might be somewhat realistic in terms of the range he's continuing with with 85 percent fold to three bet so by three betting this is the range that we have isolated ourselves against with ace jack so now let's see what our adjusted equity is given that we have decided to 3-bet for value in this spot. We can now see that our equity is only 28% and what this pretty much means is despite the fact that we are ahead of Villain's cutoff opening range, 
Hero has actually made a huge mistake by 3-betting here, because what's important is not the range that Villain is open raising from the cutoff, but the range that Villain is continuing with to Hero's 3-bet. And as we can see, that's a very tight range, and Hero is actually going to be behind the range that Villain is continuing with. However, if we take a much wider range, perhaps we go back to our 25% range, and we then adjust it so that perhaps Villain has something like a fold to, fold to 3 bet of 30%. Villain is then going to be continuing with 70% of that 25% range. And Hero's Hand is going to do a lot better against Villain's range that continues to a 3 bet in general. It still will actually be somewhat close with a hand like Ace Jack. So even button versus cutoff in a lot of situations, there really might not be any need to 3-bet the hand like ace-jack for value. Even though for some players, it does seem to be a very standard spot for them to take a hand like ace-jack, the cutoff open raises, and they are 3-bet on the button. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, I'm just saying that perhaps it's a lot closer than most people realise when you consider the equity involved. And of course it does all depend on villain. Uh, villain is going to be somewhat reasonable if he's has an ATS of 25% but perhaps villain is just a huge drooler who is opening a wide range of hands and he is going to continue a lot wider in which case ace jack is still going to be in very good shape and is a good hand to value 3 bet. So hopefully we can see why it is important that villain has a low fault to 3 bet. If villain has a high fault to 3 bet and you take a somewhat strong hand but not that strong like ace jack and you 3 bet for value you end up isolating yourself against a range which you are behind and here's an interesting question to ask with our ace jack offsuit if we are behind when villain calls and for example say that villain 4 bets in the example we've just looked at we'd pretty much have to fold ace jack assuming that we are pretty much crushed by his 4 betting range What's the difference between having ace jack off and jack four off suit? In actual fact, there is pretty much no difference because it's just the same as having jack four off suit. We hate a hand when called and we have to fold to a four bet. It doesn't really make a hell of a lot of difference whether we have ace jack off suit and jack four off suit. So, what we are effectively doing by three betting ace jack off suit is just taking that hand and throwing it into the muck. You throw ace jack off suit in the muck when you 3-bet in a spot where you have a profitable flat. So with a hand like Jack-4 offsuit, we'd probably never consider flatting uh, on the button against a cut of open raise. But a hand like Ace-Jack offsuit, when we plug the numbers into Poker Stove, we see that this hand is actually a favourite against Villain's 25% uh, opening range from the cutoff. And also, Hero will have the benefit of position. So by 3-betting, Hero is actually throwing away this profitable opportunity to flat on the button and play play with a hand in position that's ahead of Villain's range. Now, I'm not saying that 3-betting Ace-Jack offsuit is going to be unprofitable in this spot. In fact, if Villain is truly folding 85% of the time to a 3-bet, you are quite possibly going to end up making a profit in this spot by 3-betting with Ace-Jack. But what you are not doing is maximizing your EV. And as far as I'm concerned, if you are not maximizing your EV, it's still going to be a leak. And a lot of the time, especially in this particular case where Villain is has a high fold to 3-bet, some of these value hands like Ace-Jack Offsuit, your best play is nearly always going to be to flat instead of 3-betting for value. How does position affect the ranges that we want to 3-bet? Well, we need to tighten up our value 3-bets out of position somewhat. And this is based on the concept that there are three elements that determine your true equity. And one of these is hand strength. So your hand will have a percent of equity against villain's hand. In the case of ace-jack offsuit against 25% range, we saw it had 55%. You will also gain some additional true equity in terms of position. So in terms of ace-jack, it had 55%, but we could perhaps add 10% to that 
because we are going to be in position and post flop we are perhaps going to be able to take the pot down even when we don't make a hand so we can add a percent of equity due to the fact we're in position and the converse applies out of position if we had a hand like ace jack against a 25% range out of position we'd possibly have to maybe deduct 10% it's all based on an estimate but in general your true equity is going to be less when you're out of position and it's going to be more when you are in position and as a result you can 3 bet slightly wider in position because even when you don't make your hand you may find some profitable situations to take the pot down and the final of the three elements is your skill level so we said we had 55% with the ace jack perhaps we can add 10% uh, for position maybe gives us 65% and perhaps we can even add another 10% due to our skill level. Again, it's all based on estimates, how much of an edge you think you have over villain. But the bigger your skill level, the higher your true equity is going to be in any given hand. However, an important thing to note is that your skill level is influenced somewhat by the stack to pot ratio. And the stack to pot ratio is going to be less in 3-bet pots. If you were playing 500 big blinds deep, for example, then skill is going to play a very big part in proceedings and you are going to be able to increase your true equity by a considerable amount just because of the skill involved. However, if you are playing 100 big blinds deep and you 3-bet to possibly around 10% of the effective stack sizes, you are going to find yourself in a situation where the stack to pot ratio is quite low, around 4 and your skill is somewhat negated because there just aren't as much stacks to play with. So in a 3-bet pot, you can't count on your skill level as much. Position and hand strength are going to be a lot more important. And in fact, the most important thing is going to be your hand strength of the 3. Because even position is negated somewhat as a result of the stack stack sizes being the stack to pot ratio being less but they both still of course play a very important role even if slightly diminished so it's one of these three elements that determines your true equity and as a result hopefully we can see that we need to tighten up value three bets out of position what kind of hands should we be 3-betting for value? And the answer to this really depends on villain. As a very rough guide, and it is just a guide, I'd expect you to be changing these ranges quite dramatically based on how villain responds to 3-bets. The kind of range I would 3-bet for value would probably look something like Ace-Queen plus and Jacks plus. I wouldn't recommend you 3-bet a lot wider than this for value unless you have a very specific reason. Against most players this is going to be quite a reasonable range to 3-bet for value. And as said you need to adjust depending on villain. There are some types of hands that you want to be very careful with 3-betting. One of these types of hands is suited connectors. And the problem with suited connectors is they are the kind of hand that benefit from having a very high stack to pot ratio in order to be profitable. So if you 3-bet a hand like 7-8 suited, yes it may look pretty but it's not actually a value bet seeing as if you 3-bet with a hand like A7 suited, in terms of absolute equity you pretty much just have 8 high and the hand is not going to play that well in a 3-bet pot. The type of hands that play well in a 3-bet pot are hands with good absolute equity. Hands like big pairs, broadways. These are the kind of hands you want to 3-bet for value with. You don't really ever want to be 3-betting a suited connector for value because it's not really a value bet. You may also run into difficulty 3-betting some of the mid to lower pocket pairs for value. Partly because they are going to be difficult to play post-flop. A lot of the time with a hand between, say, pocket 5s and pocket 10s, overcards are going to hit the board. And it's going to be a lot easier to play in a 3-bet pot with a hand that ends up having more equity. 
than a mid pocket pair such as a hand that has over cards such as a hand like ace queen or ace jack also part of the problem with three betting these hands stems from the fact that the equity distribution of pocket pairs just to take one type of hand is not linear so it's not a gradual decline in profitability from pocket aces down to pocket twos the way it works is this pocket aces will be a very profitable hand pocket kings will be a lot less profitable than aces but still profitable queen queen will be a bit less profitable than pocket kings uh, pocket jacks will be less profitable than queens but the slope in terms of value is is decreasing uh, pocket tens will be less profitable than jacks but perhaps even a bit similar and pocket nines is probably not going to be a lot less profitable than pocket tens pocket eights is not going to be a lot less profitable than pocket nines and pocket fives is not going to be a lot less profitable than pocket tens even so in fact while it may seem like it might be good to three bet a hand like pocket tens for value and fold pocket fives in actual fact there's not a lot of difference between pocket tens and pocket fives in terms of the hands in villains range that they are going to do well against so in general it's not advised that you 3-bet these type of hands for value. Okay so I think that about concludes the first part of these videos on 3-betting. Yes it's quite a lot of information to take in. But the topic of 3-betting is quite a complex topic. And